It's Friday, March 3rd. He was a lawyer, a power broker. Now he's a convicted murderer. We start here. Indictment for murder. Guilty verdict. Just hours after receiving the case, jurors find Alec Murdoch guilty. They came in on the same page after listening to weeks worth of testimony. What made this case so open and shut and where it goes from here? The train wreck in Ohio became a partisan firestorm, but it could lead to bipartisan regulations. Increase the fines, um, which have been minimal. It's going to require enough people to run these trains. We got Senator Sherrod Brown from Ohio describing a new rail safety bill. And the lies didn't get him expelled from Congress, so what else would they be looking for? Specifically, his campaign finances, which is going to be a major part of what this subcommittee will focus on. The new investigation into George Santos by his new colleagues. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. The trial of South Carolina lawyer Alec Murdoch has been going on for over a month. The charges go back nearly two years. The state arguing that Murdoch murdered his wife and son because his alleged financial misdoings were about to be revealed as part of another case. And in some ways, the fascination around this case goes even further back. Once Murdoch was officially charged, whispers and rumors became full-blown accusations going back close to a decade. The now disbarred attorney already in jail facing dozens of charges, including stealing millions from clients and even allegedly planning his own murder for insurance money. All revolving around this family that's had influence on county investigations going back generations. And yet despite all that, despite this web of allegations and alibis, it took a jury only a few hours to convict him last night. The state versus Richard Alexander Murdoch defendant, indictment for murder, guilty verdict. Let's start today with the verdict everyone's talking about. Let's go to noted litigator Shauna Lloyd from the Cochran Firm. She's a legal contributor for ABC News. Shauna, can we start with this Alec Murdoch verdict? I mean, what were the charges and what did the jury find here? Alec Murdoch was charged with murder of his wife and his son in addition to improper use of a firearm. He was found guilty on all charges. The jury has now considered the evidence um, for a significant period of time and um, the evidence of guilt is overwhelming. So on the night of the murder, what allegedly has happened is that the wife, Maggie Murdoch, and Paul Murdoch were found shot dead at the family kennels, which is a little further down the family home on the Moselle estate. I didn't shoot my wife or my son anytime. Ever. Alex Murdoch's defense was that he was napping. He went and visited his mother. He wasn't aware of what was happening at all, even though he was present on the same property. Now, the state is indicating that he was there. He was present and that he committed these murders. There is only one person who had the motive, who had the means, who had the opportunity to commit these crimes, and also whose guilty conduct after these crimes betrays him. This jury came to a verdict in just a few short hours, which means that they came in on the same page after listening to weeks worth of testimony and evidence being submitted. What do you think made the difference then? Like if the verdict came in so quickly, do you have a sense as a litigator like what they were probably thinking? Absolutely. I think that when we look at this particular case, Alex Murdoch claimed to have never been at the kennels. He claimed he was very far away at the family home. He wasn't aware of what was happening. He claimed this all the way until trial. During the trial on the stand, there was a Snapchat video that came out that placed his voice at the scene of the crime minutes before the murder. Family members, people who have known him for over 20 years, identified his voice in the video. Once I lied, I continued to lie, yes, sir. Why? You know, oh, what a tangled web we weave. He then got on the stand and admitted he lied. That was one of the most damaging pieces of evidence to his defense. Right, you go up there and you tell people, yeah, I, I did lie about where I was. Yes, I did make up an alibi. Yes, I was there. And I didn't tell anyone, but no, I didn't actually do it. Like, good luck convincing them of that. Absolutely. And I mean, let's think about this. Your wife and your son are murdered and you don't give over all the key information, you know, mm. you don't remember that you were at the very place that you later found their bodies. Something about that is entirely disingenuous. And the jury clearly saw straight through his testimony. What type of sentence are we talking about? 
Later today, we're going to be listening into the sentencing. During the sentencing, the judge has to do a minimum of 30 years, but he has the discretion to seek up to life imprisonment. We had no doubt that if we had a chance to present our case in a court of law, that they would see through the one last con that Alec Murdoch was trying to pull. And they did, and we're so grateful for that. And let's that remember, Murdoch... the state may also throw in aggravating factors to help the judge get to a higher sentence. So looking forward then, Sean, like on one hand, there are other accusations now against him that go back even further, right? So I'm wondering if this conviction matters for what happens next. On the other hand, there's also a juror like dismissed just yesterday. So are there chances that that sort of affects an appeals process? Like, what do you think sort of comes next here? Yes, yesterday there was a juror that was dismissed because she was having outside communications regarding this trial. Though it does not appear that the, the conversations were that extensive, it did involve the juror offering her opinion um, regarding evidence received. That is going to be, in addition to the fact that the judge let in the evidence of his financial crimes and a number of other things, the defense are going to use that to file appeals right. to say that this whole trial should be thrown out and it should be retried. What I admit is that I misled them, I did wrong, and that I stole their money. I mean, there's so much that's coming next, Brad. What we're going to see is he has admitted on the stand that he stole money from clients. He stole money from his law firm. So now we're going to see those charges play out in the criminal system. We're also seeing that they're looking back into deaths that have surrounded this family, such as the death of the housekeeper that who died on their property, and he stole the money from her family. And how would you describe your state of mind at that time? That was a very bad place. I thought that it would make it easier on my family. We also have this attempted shooting where he attempted to commit suicide by having someone shoot him, which he did not die, um, in an effort to avoid the implications and the responsibilities because his law firm had found out that he had been stealing money. We also found out about his son, who was in a boating accident where a young woman died. There's allegations of underage drinking involved. So what we're seeing is a lot of other cases that are spiraling out of this particular case. Yeah, and you think about how known this family was in the community. Like, they, they, some people called this Murdoch County, where we're talking about here, where this family of trial lawyers going back generations all had a hand in criminal investigations. I feel like that's the legacy here, that in so many areas, there are these families that have power, that have influence, that are kind of able to squash rumors from even starting. And yet none of that helped Alec Murdoch with this jury, which, again, just took a few hours. Incredibly quick decision here. Uh, Shauna Lloyd from the Cochran Firm. Appreciate the perspective. Great to see you, Brad. Oh, God. What caused it? Train derailed. A train derailed. The train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, occurred exactly a month ago today. And since then, a lot of Americans know a whole lot more about train safety and how it's changed in recent years. For one, trains are getting longer. I didn't know this, but in just the decade between 2008 and 2017, the average freight train hauled 25% more cars. Back in the 90s, the average train was just over 100 cars. The train that plowed off the tracks in Ohio had 149. Part of this is because of technology that allowed trains to have stronger brakes, fewer workers. But union leaders have also been saying for years that this is all coming at an expense to safety. Do more with less mentality. Cut your workforce to bare bones which that in turn creates a safety issue. They say the evidence for that was that plume of smoke that rose over East Palestine. So this week, a group of bipartisan senators, including both senators from Ohio, came forward with a new bill on rail safety. And we're joined this morning by one of those sponsors, Senator Sherrod Brown, Democrat from Ohio. Senator Brown, thanks for being here. This bill has a ton of provisions, but let me ask you about one in particular. This would force freighters to notify states when you're transporting hazardous chemicals. How often are trains passing through towns with chemicals that residents aren't aware of? Oh, I think in every case, these these um, trains, they don't have to call the state government. They don't notify local hazmat firefighters who may not be trained in fire in, in fighting hazmat fires. Uh, it's pretty shocking when you think you, this was a 150 train, 150 car train. Uh, nobody really knew what it was that it was in Ohio. I mean, you can sometimes know, but they don't have to notify. They came through major population centers before the derailment in East 
East Palestine, which has 5,000 people in that community. And the damage has been extensive. And this law that Senator, this bill, Senator Vance and I are working on, are going to increase the fines, um, which have been minimal. It's going to require enough people to run these trains. The rail companies want only one uh, worker in, in on this 150 uh, car train and that that makes no sense to us so we're gonna we're gonna strengthen these safety rules and regulations so if if a derailment happens they'll be less frequent and they will be less damaging when they happen hey much of this bill is basically setting guidelines and timetables and protocols for safety inspections and they would be fulfilled by the secretary of transportation it's like the secretary of transportation can set this and set that do you think that Secretary Pete Buttigieg should have been more proactive on train safety during the first two years of this administration? Well, there are there are limits on what Secretary of Transportation or the National Transportation Safety Board can do because the laws were too weak and the rules they inherited were too weak because the rail company lobbyists have been so effective in pushing administrations to weaken the rules. And I mean, an example, this company, Norfolk Southern, did $3 billion in stock buybacks last year. They were about to do billions more this year until this train crash made them back off. They laid off a third of their workforce over the last 10 years, which means that safety inspections are almost cursory because they, a, a worker has to do so many of them uh, and there aren't enough workers. Uh, the fines were minimal, averaging only $10,000 over the last several years. And that's just an annoyance to a company that's doing these stock buybacks, these billions of dollars in stock buybacks. So um, this is a fun function of greed and uh, pursuit of profits. I understand that. But when you cut safety, when you compromise safety in, for the sake of profits, you have what happens in East Palestine. And that's why Senator Vance and I have teamed up to do this bill. But I, I appreciate that, that there might be like lobbying happening from the rail industry. I, I do know that Republicans have generally not backed these type of regulations that unions have been asking for. There's more money for train infrastructure in this bill. Many of your Republican co-sponsors voted against some of the infrastructure money that was already allocated. I know Marco Rubio several years ago voted against a rule that would have required more specialized breaks. I mean, are, are your co-sponsors, your GOP colleagues here, have they been part of the problem? Well, everybody's part of the problem. I'm not I'm not going to engage in partisan name calling here. Um, I have thoughts about it. I have thoughts about um, deregulation and all that that um, some people have pushed. But Senator Vance and I, Senator Vance is much more conservative than I. He, I don't know him well yet because we're just starting to work together. But he reached out. We reached out. Um, we want to see this bipartisan bill move forward. And I think we all learned something from this. When rail lines, when the railroads do big stock buybacks and lay people off and every quarter go to Wall Street and celebrate cost cutting and Wall Street rewards them with higher uh, with, with with higher stock prices, uh, something's wrong. And um you know, I think a number of my colleagues have learned that. That's why uh, three Republicans joined three Democrats on this bill. Hey, the EPA at this point has assured residents that their testing is not finding toxic levels in the air that are dangerous to their health. But you're an Ohio resident, right? Would you feel comfortable moving into East Palestine right now? Um, I don't know. I, I was there with the EPA Administrator Regan. Um, I heard the mayor, um, who's a conservative guy, say that um, the water is drinkable. The EPA, both uh, the governor's EPA and the president's EPA have both said the water is drinkable. But they also cautioned if you're moving back into your home or a new place, you should test the water in the soil, in the air, including on in your furniture internally and all in your house. Um, that those those will all be paid for by by Norfolk Southern. We're insisting that they pay for continuous testing and monitor for the for monitoring for the foreseeable future. And one other thing, um, if people develop two years, five years, uh, ten years out, if they de begin to develop certain kinds of bronchial or uh, bronchial illnesses or cancers, uh, Norfolk Southern should be on the hook there too. I just wrote with Senator Tester um, legislation called the PACT Act, which which um, focuses on men and women in the service that were exposed to these football field size burn pits in Iraq and Afghanistan. We listed 23 illnesses that, that were caused, we think are medical science think are caused by that. And if you present to any VA with one of those 23 illnesses, you get immediate care or you don't have to hire a lawyer and all that. We're looking for that same construct, if you will, um, to take care of people in East Palestine. 
and there is already resistance from the rail industry. The Association of American Railroads said this, quote, wish list includes items that would not have made a difference here, like those crew sizes you mentioned. They also say 99.9% of freight makes it to its destination safely, although some have said that shows how devastating that small percentage of accidents can be. Senator Sherrod Brown from Ohio. Thanks for being with us. Glad to do it. Thank you. One of the biggest conundrums in Washington this year has been the new congressman, George Santos. Did, did McCarthy tell you to, to step I'm away sorry. from the committees? Or did Nobody you make this tells me to do anything. I'm Remember, this is the guy from New York who exaggerated and fabricated huge parts of his resume during election season. He got voted in. Everyone found out later he was sworn in anyway. I got you guys some donuts. Here we go. Donuts and coffee for all the hard work you guys do. He's become this walking punchline to the point where, to some, he almost comes across as endearing. Just a sweater-wearing guy who puts out rainbow cupcakes in the hallways and tries to politely avoid anyone asking him tough questions. Are you considering resigning? No, I'm not. Well, members of Congress certainly have not forgotten his story. And yesterday, the House Ethics Committee announced it was officially investigating George Santos. ABC's Will Staken covers the House. Will... What is this investigation? Yeah, so like you said, after facing scrutiny over a host of lies that uh, Congressman Santos said before he got elected, on Thursday, the House Ethics Committee announced that it voted earlier in the week to impanel an entire subcommittee just to look into George Santos, and there is a lot to look into. New York free, Santos free. Santos has falsely claimed everything from being a star collegiate volleyball athlete to having worked from Golden Sachs to even falsely claiming his mother was at the World Trade Center on 9-11. Whatever it takes to do and get to where he needs to be, there's a lie. And perhaps most vile of all, you lied about the Holocaust in a mass shooting. Ultimately, what Santos might be most concerned about here, what might land him in the hottest water, come down to his finances. Mm. And specifically, his campaign finances, which is going to be a major part of what this subcommittee will focus on. There's a lot of questions that have come up, including he had this massive donation that he seems to can't, can't really explain where it came from. Numerous uh, charges on his uh, campaign financial disclosures that were just under the limit that you would need to provide a receipt, which, you know, campaign finance experts say raises number of alarm bells. So a lot of those things is what this subcommittee is going to look into. And those are, you know, the kind of things that could land him in hot water. And hot water, when it comes to a in congressional investigation like this, I mean, what are the potential outcomes or consequences of this type of investigation? Yeah, I, so, so basically the committee's going to look into this, the subcommittee will look into this and see if they do find evidence of wrongdoing. And if they do, they can recommend a censure or they could even recommend expulsion. The questions have been arisen. The, the people of this district have voted for him. Now, the, the one thing that is important here is Speaker McCarthy has kind of stood by George Santos and made all this. At least he hasn't called for him to outright resign. And right, he, like he, could, he could have already tried to get him expelled, and he hasn't. Exactly. And, you know, he, he's certainly not singing his praises, but he's not calling for him to step down. Um, ethics is moving through, and if ethics finds something, we'll take action. And, you know, obviously there is a numbers issue there. He, he has an extremely slim majority. He doesn't want to lose any support when he's looking for votes in the House. And the one thing he has been saying is essentially there needs to be a process before he would take any action against Congressman Santos. And this ethics subcommittee investigating Santos, that would be that process. And so following the investigation, we'll have to see if Kevin McCarthy does actually take any action. What's Santos saying for you? Like, I know he doesn't, like, give a ton of sit-down interviews with you. Yeah, no, he doesn't really talk to us. Uh, he, he recently gave an interview to OAN, uh, obviously a much more friendly uh, outlet. I've been, I've said I was sorry many times. I've behaved as if I'm sorry. Look, if, if you're, if you want to compare uh, emotions, people show emotions differently. I am sorry. I'm deeply sorry. I've, but, you know, what he did do is immediately after this news broke, he did tweet out that he's fully cooperating with this investigation. But, you know, I think largely, if you actually pay attention to what he's doing, maybe not what he's saying, he's trying to make himself this new star of the MAGA right. Santos has been seen walking the halls of Congress with a gun lapel. You can see it there. I mean, we have national everything, but why not have a national gun? It's, it's... I was speaking to one of Santos's top aides earlier this week, and he basically told me that he wants to, quote, make Santos the sassiest member of Congress. All right, that is Will Staken, whose job every day is to chase George Santos and many other members of Congress around the halls. Thank you so much, Will. Thanks, Brad. And one last thing. 
Americans have a fascination with the idea of the repo man. I'm Ronnie Lee with EJ Recovery, and we're looking for a 2012 Dodge Charger. Seems like you've been six months behind, man, so they sent us out here to repossess six it. Six months behind? I'm from current. You got it in the back? So much so that there's a TV show called Operation Repo, but for many car owners, He's the end of the road. He's the personification of what happens when you can't make your car payments. What is going on here? How you what doing, ma'am? This is my are car. You, are you are? Who are you, ma'am? No, you don't worry about who I am. Are, who are you? Are this you? Is my are car. you hanging? But what if there was another way to do this? Well, some car companies apparently have new ideas for how to repossess a vehicle. Ford and other automotive companies patent more than a thousand ideas every year. That's Phoebe Wall Howard, a reporter from the Detroit Free Press. She covers the auto industry, and she recently examined a new patent from Ford that would make it possible to repossess your car remotely. So if someone doesn't pay their bill, if they're behind on the car payment, first you would get a warning on your phone. Then you would get a warning on the uh, infotainment screen in your vehicle. And because cars are no longer just combustion engines, but computer computers with outputs and crucially inputs, it's easier than ever to make a car more difficult to drive, more annoying. If you're not responding to the lending institution, uh, then they can start doing things like playing annoying sounds in your vehicle. It can be beeping or chiming. They may uh, choose to shut off your air conditioning, choose to shut off your seat adjustments. It eventually graduates to locking you out of the car or shutting off the engine. Eventually, Howard says, as engineers thought about how not just to shut off the car, but have it self-drive itself away. As in, you wake up one morning and your car isn't in the driveway. This is the new patent idea, is drive away from your house, away from your workplace, uh, you know, back to the repo. Or, in fact, included in this patent application is the idea that if the mileage is too high or the lending institution views your vehicle as unworthy, it can just literally drive itself to the scrapyard. Now, anyone can file for a patent. It's just a concept. Doesn't mean it's going to be reality. But it does give you a sense of how big car companies are viewing this world of repo. It's a high-risk industry. Customers will sometimes take their frustrations out on the car or even the person taking it away. In the application, they actually say that, that this is a conflict avoidance strategy. And yet, doesn't that seem, I don't know, cruel? I get frustrated when companies make me complain to computers. Imagine if your lifeline to the outside world was being taken away by someone in a cubicle and some software. What if somebody's trying to pay their loan back, Phoebe? What if it, like, would they keep you, wouldn't that keep you from going to work to theoretically pay the loan back? In the patent application, they talk about geofencing your vehicle or making it so you can only drive it in the areas that in involve your work. Or the other thing is locking you out of your vehicle on non-work days. Oh, like you can have your car to work, but not for fun. This car is not for fun anymore. Yes. In a statement, Ford said, we submit patents on new inventions as a normal course of business, but they aren't necessarily an indication of new business or product plans. But if you think car companies are just tinkering around for no reason, consider this. Repossessions plummeted at the start of the pandemic when people got stimulus checks and when lenders weren't sure what was going to happen next. Now, the repo man is coming more and more often. Credit analysts say Americans are increasingly falling behind on their car payments. So next time you park your car, ask yourself how much you trust it to stay in one place. One of the readers said to me that he planned to forever park his car in a garage so you couldn't drive it away. Also, I know cars aren't alive, but the idea of a vehicle driving itself to a scrapyard it makes me very sad for some reason. Maybe I watched The Brave Little Toaster too many times as a kid. I don't know. Start Here is produced by Kelly Therese, Jen Newman, Brenda Salinas Baker, Madeline Wood, Vika Aronson, Iru Ekpanobi, Cameron Chertavian, and Tara Gimble. Ariel Chester is our social media producer. Josh Cohan is director of podcast programming. I'm our managing editor. Laura Mayer is our executive producer. Thanks to Lakia Brown, John Newman, Liz Alessi, and our intern, Amira Williams. Special thanks this week to Chris Berry, Aaron Ferrer, and Flair. Mara Milwaukee, and our big congratulations to one of our regular guest hosts, Mary Alice Parks, who just had a beautiful baby boy. Welcome to the world, Patrick. I'm Brad Milkey. See you next week.